Hey, I think this is a pretty good video actually. It's got a lot of good, good material in it. it. It is kind of long, but you know, YouTube doesn't lose your play, so uh, you know, you can watch some and, and come back later if uh, you don't have two hours and six minutes all in one shot. You don't have to lose your place with YouTube. Just want to say that. Uh, a lot of stuff all through it that's is pretty good. So, you will learn some things about manipulation techniques and highly skilled NLP in the church and other churches. I want to um, talk about recognizing techniques being used within the art of persuasion by masters at persuasion in various religious and other organizations. So I said we're going to look at people who are really persuasive and see what they do to persuade us. And we're going to be looking at uh, leaders uh, or people people in, in religious leadership uh, that are very good at this. We're going to look at Dieter Uchtdorf because, you know, basically I do my thing basically on Mormonism. But we're going to see some very similar... Um, <laughs> We're going to see some stuff that's going to be kind of interesting because we're going to feature people that are, you know, from the Watchtower, Jehovah's Witnesses there, um, <clears throat> SDA, and uh, then we're going to see some people who are actually the members of these various churches, uh, and uh, maybe one or, one or two from that, that were Scientologists as well. So we're going to have SDA, JWs, and LDS. We're going to get into the initials game. Pretty interesting because what these people have have us all believing, although the theologies are a little bit different, the methods of persuasion and control of a large group of people um, is rather amazing. So, uh, we'll, we'll get into that and uh, we'll look at how people that appear to be polar opposites in public seem to be buddies behind the scenes sometimes, or maybe much more often than we thought. It's important to realize how skilled and trained these people actually are in the art of persuasion, because they have influenced our thinking a great deal. We need to be aware of how they do this, and then why. So, let's quickly freeze your programming right now, so you can get some value out of this video. Most likely you've been conditioned to reject as a polar opposite of you and controlled by an evil force one of these two people, maybe both. But if it's one of them, then that's more of a concern because you have been conditioned by some sort of media, by some people, to associate one of these two, most likely, with some sort of evil in your mind. All right, so let's let's go with that because I want to talk about conditioning our minds to on who, to filter information and to accept or reject based on indoctrination to particular viewpoints and organizations that tell us that they have the truth and others are opposites and are controlled by an evil force and seek to lead us astray and that's especially going to be what we find in uh, religious organizations. And so we're talking about the LDS Church here, and what I want you to do is put any feelings of, uh, of that sort, put them on the shelf, put them on the back burner, and stay with this, because if it gets a little uncomfortable, you're gonna have to, you, what you should do is be asking yourself why, and looking for a rational reason, not, oh, it's Satan, He's seeking to lead us astray because I can replace that picture of Gordon B. Hinckley with, you know, uh, L. Ron Hubbard or, uh, you know, a, or a leader of uh, SDA or, or the Watchtower. And all of those organizations are going to say, we're God's one true church. Everybody else is seeking to lead you away into the mists of darkness where you will be led, you know, down to hell. All of these organizations are going to say that, but if you're, you know, in this case, if you're with the LDS, you know that the other ones are all false, and you've got the truth. Well, you also know you've been given the gift of the Holy Ghost, is what you've been told, so you should be able to discern truth from error, okay? This isn't like you walking into a bar or something, and the Holy Ghost says, see ya, I'm out of here, okay? 
we've been trying to reject people as not credible that that share information that doesn't support a particular belief system and what I'm going to show is how manipulation takes place so quick example if you're you know true be if you're you're a faithful LDS you're you're probably looking over there at Hillary Clinton and you say yeah she's throwing the devil horns and you know how appropriate that is she is just terrible and she's deceiving and she represents everything we believe is evil abortion and and uh, all sorts of, of things d destructive of faith faith in the Lord Jesus Christ who Gordon B Hinckley would be telling us about but if you're a Hillary supporter you're probably not you know a typical LDS person but you it's possible but more likely you're not and you look at this guy and you go listen that guy is head of a religion that is bigoted they're a bunch of homophobes and this guy was in support of you know wars that went and, and just bombed you know Iraq and, and Afghanistan and all over the place and murdered hundreds of thousands of innocent people for you know for conquest those of us who are American citizens stand solidly with the president of our nation. The terrible forces of evil must be confronted and held accountable for their actions. This is not a matter of Christian against Muslim. It is clear from these and other writings that there are times and circumstances when nations are justified, in fact, have an obligation to fight for family, for liberty, and against tyranny, threat, and oppression. When all is said and done, we of this church are people of peace. We are followers of our Redeemer, the Lord Jesus Christ, who is the Prince of Peace. But even he said, think not that I am come to send peace on earth, I came not to send peace, but a sword. So, Gordon B. Hinckley there um, did some pretty interesting things. And uh, I've dissected that whole talk, really, in another video. It starts off with the word um, overview. And there's a picture of him on it. And it's, uh, anyway. Yeah, it's an overview of a kind of a trilogy on, on some pretty interesting things on corporate governance and so forth. And... At any rate, um, when we took when I took a look at that, um, his talk was it was as a, it was a masterful job of persuasion and sales techniques and hypnotic language and uh, NLP and basically manipulating people from a position of. Um, believing in peace and love and kindness and all those good things that Jesus Christ is supposed to be about to what he just said at the end where he said you know we follow our Redeemer Jesus Christ and he uses all this you know rhythmic language which gets you kind of more into the alpha wave brain uh, state where you're more receptive you're feeling more relaxed and then he says that somehow gives us the ultimately confusing thing. Jesus, you know, the Prince of Peace came with a sword. He came not to bring peace, but a sword. That's pretty confusing, isn't it? So we see the guy with the sword here. It's about to kill Abraham, except for we're not going to get into the whole Book of Abraham thing and <clears throat> realize that, you know, actually it was somebody's embalming a body. It had nothing to do with Abraham. And it, you know, <clears throat> it wasn't this, but. This will be our Jesus with his sword getting ready to kill somebody and Abraham's, you know, doing what he says in the story. No, no, don't kill me, Jesus. Um, why would Jesus go from the Prince of Peace to saying it's okay that, that he brought, you know, uh, violence? And, and if we look at what Gordon B. Hinckley does in that talk, he associates people who had nothing to do with any attack on the people of the United States with that and he associates them with the Gadianton robbers of the Book of Mormon the ultimate bad guys um, and then he associates the people of the United States as protecting their religion and their families and all those good things that we're told we'll have forever if we just obey these guys 
who say they speak for God. And what we have to do is go, you know, support the military effort to go invade these countries and 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 try not to think about the fact that we're bombing these people and and you know incinerating people, blowing them to bits, and they did nothing to deserve it. But he associates them with these bad people in our minds, and people. I don't know anyone. I don't know anyone that thinks that the people of Iraq had anything to do with, um, you know, planes flying into uh, the Twin Towers. No, I don't know anybody who thinks that, but yet Iraq was invaded. It wasn't even associated in any meaningful way with that, but it was an excuse. You know, and, and, and then we had to move off another excuse saying, oh, you might have the ability to defend yourselves. You know, you might have nuclear weapons, which they proved that they didn't. And then they just said, oh, what the hell, we'll just bomb you to death anyway. So guys like this, like Hinckley, you know, in various religions did the same thing. They, they go in support of the uh, industrial, you know, <laughs> military complex to convince people that it's the right thing to do and Jesus wants them to do it. And he goes through a lot in that speech where, and I'm not going to go all through it here, but he, you know, he, he, he does various exercises to tell us that it's patriotic, that, you know, that's what we signed up for. If you're in the military, you signed up for it. You're like Captain Moroni defending his people's liberty and religion and everything you care about. And the guys that you're defending against are the people that are actually the ones who are trying to defend their families from an aggressor, which is the people from the United States. And, and, and these aren't really hidden facts, but somehow this guy manages to, to, to say these things, and, and, and at least some people believed him. But there's no basis for it in reality. If you examine the facts, there is none. You don't have to, you don't have to, you know, buy the whole, you, you don't have to worry about how the buildings went down, you know, demolition style. You don't have to do any of that. You can just say it was everything that the government tried to tell us it was, and it still has nothing to do with the people in Iraq. And yet this guy's a prophet of God, supposedly, and he's saying God approves of it, and, and God is with the soldiers. He reigns in the, and he rules in the armies of the nations. Everything's going to be okay. And, uh, and, and this LDS soldiers that ride home are telling us they're, they're proud, they're glad to be representing our people and our way of life, and they know God is with them in what they're doing. And it's, if you look at the factual evidence, it's just unthinkable. So, anyway, this is a great example, and uh, we're going to look at more examples of how um, persuasion techniques are used. And so, in wrapping this one up, so I've looked and said, okay, great, there's no factual basis for this, so how does he do it? Well, first of all, the, the groundwork is laid because if you've read the Book of Mormon and you're a member of the LDS Church, then you've got the persecution complex going on. You know, Joseph Smith was persecuted because Satan was trying to destroy the church and all that sort of a thing. And then you've got the history, you know, well, you, you've got the story line there, the Nephites and the Lamanites. Nephites are the good guys and the Lamanites are the bad guys. And they're always after the good guys. Always attacking them for no good reason at all. And so the Nephites are just defending everything that's precious to a normal person, your family, your relationships, and your freedom. And, and of course, your freedom to worship this great God that, you know, occasionally actually protects these people somewhat if they're super righteous in the story. Um, and so, and then you got the bad guys getting in. So the power of association, these are... These whole things are linked to our values of what's precious to us, our family relationships and the hope of eternal life, you know, living forever with our families after this life, after you're dead. The hope is that, A, you live, and B, it's with people you love. Okay? And so you got to defend the religion that um, qualifies you for that. And um, Hinckley 
links all that in because it's linked in the Book of Mormon story. That's what they're fighting for. The Nephites are fighting for their ability to live free and to worship in a way that will allow them these blessings in the next life, which is where the payoff really supposedly comes from. God, who doesn't really pay much in this life unless you're a minister of some sort. However, in the Book of Mormon, we do have the you know, Gospel of Prosperity taught there. It does say, if you keep, in as much as you keep my commandments, you shall prosper in the land. Um, so all the people that are at the top of the church are prospering, so they're the most righteous, right? In other words, rich guys go to the top in leadership, corporate leaders, you know, lawyers and, and, and CEOs and doctors and, cert, you know, all these guys. They don't have shoe repair guys in the Quorum of the Twelve. Sorry, it doesn't happen. And uh, so, obviously, you know, they must be spiritual. God bless them because they're so righteous. It's circular reasoning and the ruling class is at the top. And then there are righteous people at the bottom, but God's just testing them. You know, we, there's some way of trying to get around the fact that it doesn't look like they're actually prospering. Well, they can just say, oh, well, he's blessing you spiritually or some other, you know, stuff like that. Or, you know, you're like Job or whatever. There's always an excuse. But the power of association was used here. Uh, and he pulls a 180, uh, which I illustrated in that other video there that goes into great detail on a bunch of things uh, regarding how things are run. But uh, the classic 180 is to, um, is to recognize and state the virtue, the, something that is actually like, you know, good or something that, you know, would be an objection. You state it, you put it out there, and then you pull a turnaround. So he says, we follow our Redeemer, we believe in peace, we're a peace-loving people, and then he comes, you know, says either however or but. And that's when you know the turnaround is coming. And so he says, but, you know, we also know that our Constitution is totally awesome because it allows us to be free, and what we're doing is we're fighting against powers of repression. So he's there. they had a, a wicked repressive dictator or something. He's somehow worse than Bush and Cheney. I don't know how, but he is. And so we'll just go ahead and, you know, kill three times as many people in his country as, as he ever did, or, or whatever. But bottom line is, we frame them, or somebody over there, as wicked, and so we're the good guys, and they're the bad guys, even though this is a war of aggression. Um, we frame it that way. It's so important how we frame it, so they turn it around, and so, so they say, it's like when Dallin H. Oaks did the same thing, or, and he did it with Jesus, the confusion thing there. He said, he's the Prince of Peace, but the Prince of Peace said, I didn't come to bring peace. I came to bring a sword. Well, what kind of a Prince of Peace brings a sword? You know? I don't know, is it Teddy Roosevelt? So, see, speak softly, but carry a big stick? A nuclear bomb or something? I mean, you know, um, there are the best defense is a good offense or, or, you know, whatever. This is aggression. All these little... They, they, they use so many, you know, fake examples to teach, to, to convince, and they're usually, there's something off in it right at the very beginning. They'll state something as though it's fact, as an assumption, and then base off of that with some other BS. Just like Dallin Oaks did when he said, God gave us a brain, or something like that, you know, and he wants you to use it, except, you know, in the case of when thinking actually goes against what we're telling you. So he doesn't word it that way. He carefully worded it and says, However, we have the gift of the Holy Ghost, which testifies of truth. So worthy Latter-day Saints don't base their testimony on facts or any historical facts or sets of them. The, you know, the Spirit witnesses the truth to you. Well, if the Spirit says it's true, but it's contra you know, is witnessing to contradicting stuff, you know, like in the Scriptures, well, that's the definition of lying. So, you know, so, so what if it's a ghost, a Holy Ghost, or whatever it is? If it's saying this is true and that everything in the book is true, but the book has places that contradict itself and the other so-called holy books, well, all he's saying is, I say everything is true even though stuff's provably lying in there. Is it contradicting itself is the definition of a lie. Nothing in our society would function if we actually functioned with these principles. You know, if you go to prove that somebody 
robbed a store, you know, at three o'clock in the afternoon or on, you know, A Street or B Street or Main Street or whatever the heck it is, they look for evidence. They don't say, well, now, you know, a ghost told me it was, uh, that's the way it happened, even though that we can prove that we had five witnesses that the guy was at home, you know, with his family and everybody saw him. Sorry, that doesn't mean anything. Um, the, the Holy Ghost said that, it, that, it, that, you know, this is the guy, it, you know, it was Johnny, not Jimmy, uh, even though the evidence doesn't represent that at all. Well, all it means is that the ghost is a liar. But no, for some reason, we give elevated status to this Holy Ghost who, who contradicts himself. So it's complete insanity. Okay, I just want to throw in like a little warning. There's a couple of spots where I use a word starting with SH, okay? As any regular watchers know, I keep it pretty clean, but uh, you know, I do use that word occasionally. And a derivative word relating to bovine excrement, and sometimes I get just a little bit irritated and considering some of the uh, tactics that some of these people use to ruin people's lives to uh, manipulate them in some of these various religions. Sometimes they blow off a little steam. So, um, other than that, just really late in there, there'll be a little warning uh, right before Raz Band comes on. It was at one uh, an hour and seven minutes, and it's probably closer to an hour and twenty now because I've thrown some stuff in front of it. But uh, you know, he comes on right after some. I don't know, it was Christopherson, who the hell it is, talking at BYU, so he's got the black and, blue, and black and blue stuff, you know, from BYU graduation on. When you see that, you know, there's going to be a little Book of Abraham hieroglyphics that are not G-rated. They're in your Book of Abraham, but you may not have noticed how obscene they are, so I'm going to mention it. Okay, at that point. And very important here, we're going to look at why this is important because, well, if we're going to recognize what is being done, then it'll help us to understand why it's important to recognize these methods that are being used. It's very revealing, trust me. So, we're going to show and discuss methods used for persuasion. Let it be understood by all that Jesus Christ stands at the head of this church which bears his sacred name. Okay, just real quick here, just want to point this out. Who talks like that? Seriously. A hypnotist? We follow Jesus Christ. He doesn't say we follow Jesus Christ, you know, or if uh, a lot of people, you listen to them, they actually say the name faster. It's like they're uncomfortable and it's showing subconsciously, like if you... You know, when I do the, like, the Three Mormons videos, <coughs> you know, reviews, watch them and watch how, like, uh, Ian, he always says Jesus Christ really fast, you know? But Gordon says Jesus Christ. Think of it. Think of the hypnotic tone there. Think of, you're feeling relaxed. All your worries are gone. You trust the Savior of the world. Everything's going to be just fine. Now write me that darn tithing check, will ya? That is right. It's fire insurance, for the righteous shall not perish, but the unrighteous shall. And then think of the songs that you sing, you know? Um, <coughs> some of the songs are, are, are just so much about rewarding obedience and punishing disobedience. Yeah, here's here's a quickie, but it's not the one I was thinking of. Okay, like in Guide Us, O the Great Jehovah. So we got like, uh, when thy judgments spread destruction, keep us safe on Zion's hill, singing praises, singing praises, songs of glory unto thee. So everyone else is getting obliterated, but that's their problem. They weren't righteous enough. We'll be praising God while everyone else is, you know, getting roasted and obliterated. Um, that doesn't sound real compassionate, but, uh, there you got some programming. You know, you got the carrot and the stick, and, uh, it's just tough for those other people. Okay, so, you know, it was, uh, we thank the O God for a prophet. How appropriate. So, it's all about obedience. And so, uh, in, in those lyrics, we, we see that, uh, being, uh, 
uh, constantly hammered into us while we're in a semi-hypnotic, you know, state of relaxation. You got the alpha waves going on. You're relaxed, and you're, and and and, and here we're singing these things of how we'll be rewarded if we obey, and those who do not obey, well, they're the, you know, it's an us them thing, and they're all screwed. You, know? you should follow the rest of this song. It's not going to sing all this crap. Okay, so Jonah was a prophet. He tried to run away, but then he later later he learned he needed to listen and obey. So in other words, life was screwed up when he didn't obey blindly his leader, which happened to be God. But we need to follow that example and just obey. Uh, when we really try, the Lord won't let us fail. Well, that's a bunch of horse crap. Um, Daniel was a prophet, refused to sin, and got saved in the lion's den. That's great. So Daniel's power was great, for he obeyed God's law. Oh, okay. So you're blessed with more faith and power in faith to do great things if you obey your leaders once again. You keep pounding it in, and you got the chorus, follow the prophet, trip, you know, follow the prophet, follow the prophet. Don't go astray, because then you're going to hell and everything's screwed. He knows the way. And the last one here. Now we have a world where people are confused. I'm confused just reading this shit. If you don't believe it, go and watch the news. Yeah, that's right. They'll mind control you. We can get direction all along the way if we heed the prophets. Follow what they say. This is like the master of mind control song. The whole way through, and you're doing it, you know, follow the prophet, follow the prophet, follow the prophet, he knows the way. Oh, I feel so relaxed, I just know all I gotta do is follow the prophet and everything will be okay. Just like uh, Gordon Hickley, we worship Jesus Christ, you're feeling relaxed. You know it's all just fine as we evolve the people. Because Jesus Christ wants Does anybody else get uncomfortable with uh, some of these examples we have in these scriptures? Um, because a lot of these are always deeply disturbing to me. They're always about uh, loyalty to the <clears throat> the overlord, which is the Lord generally. Or, you know, or, or it equates, you know, these guys are... These guys represent him, so so they take on that mantle of authority. So with Abraham, we we notice well Abraham has to sacrifice his son, you know, but he it, it doesn't turn out that way in the end. But he has to prove he's willing to murder his own son because he, for what? For worship, to show subservience to some guy who's actually supposed to be your heavenly father. So, like, if you become a god, would you actually have your children, like, murder their own children just to show how much they care about you? Is, is there something sick here? No kidding. Okay, so Jesus does kind of the similar thing. He's like, well, the guy says, you know, I need to, you know, go to the family funeral. He's like, hey, screw that. You know, don't waste your time with your family. Um, you need to serve me and to hell, to hell with them, basically. Or he who does not hate his father and mother or, or who, you know, who puts his sister and brother is not worthy of me. Um, it, there's another scripture like that. And I, those ones always really didn't hit me. They hit me wrong. I was like, that's screwed up, you know. Abraham is, he has to be willing to kill his child. Which, what a bunch of crap that is, you know. Or dump your family so you can go on a mission. You know, um, basically, and which is the church just maximizes on that so much. And then they use total mind control. You know, you can't even talk to your parents, but like twice a year or something. You know, and you're writing letters. Yeah, you know, now, now they got email, but it's ridiculous. And they're all mind control, you know, techniques. You know, cutting you off from your family. And, you know, telling you, you know, when you can get up, when you can go to bed, when you can go to the bathroom. You have no privacy. You got a companion with you all the time. Uh, rules for everything. You got to have wear a certain, you know, clothing. Your hair's got to be a certain way. All these things, you know, that's behavioral control, information control. Uh, there are so many things. I well, I'll, I'll do some specifically on mind control techniques, but I, I just want to go through this stuff because this is going to be a pretty long video anyway. But we're going to see these people doing things that are succeeding in controlling mass amounts of people into believing this stuff so that they're subservient 
and willing to be sheep. And remember, sheep are stupid. Be a sheep, be stupid. But that's okay. You're supposed to trust the shepherd, the good shepherd. Well, guess what? They usually raise those animals so they can kill them. They're protecting you from the wolves so they can eat you themselves. All right. Moving right along. Anyway, Jonathan Streeter does the Thinker of Thoughts put out, you know, this thing for us to notice a little bit about what Dieter's doing. And then he, he didn't really say anything on this, but he writes something in his description for you to notice. And then <clears throat> right after this, I watched one where he's got Jeffrey Holland and they're using specific techniques that Jonathan is discussing. What Jonathan doesn't do, and I'm not saying he's good or bad for it, because there are pros and cons to announcing that this man is actually using manipulative techniques intentionally, which, which Jeffrey Holland is doing. Uh, and which Dieter is doing here, is that it scares the faithful away because instantly we've been programmed to say, oh, well, you must be evil. You're aligned with Satan you, if you speak against the Lord's anointed. So, and that's what the same thing that they do with the Jehovah's Witnesses. That's the same thing other religions, you know, the Scientologists or the SDA would probably be doing is to get you to say, oh, well, this guy is aligned with the enemy. He's there to deceive us. Forget that you've got, you know, your gift of the Holy Ghost to discern or anything. Run away. Don't listen. So I suggest uh, you take a look at those. They're pretty short, and so you can see the complete uh, video on what he shows, you know, Dieter doing. We're going to use a little clip here, and the one on Jeffrey Holland. He really goes in depth, um, discussing exactly how he is uh, just absolutely manipulating us uh, using various techniques. Um, into uh, believing something that is completely ridiculous and so uh yeah let's watch that and the uh, thinker of thoughts is jonathan streeter uh if you can see the, the deeter when he, he released like yesterday or something like november 7th or so um and for me the holland one was was the next one that i saw after that uh so maybe they're like synced in order because in our minds these people have been built up to be you know these wonderful representatives these agents or brokers for deity for the lord jesus christ and here Dieter's telling us watch out for satan he's out there to deceive you it's the same thing that, that the watchtower leaders do for the j-dubs you know it's the same thing that they do in all these religions there are specific mind control techniques that are used to manipulate the way that we think and, and help us to filter out anything that will help us to notice what's going on. So anyway, I wanted to talk about not so much NLP techniques and in hypnotic you know, language induction and things that are being used in this particular video here. I just wanted to notice a couple of things, how, how um, guys like you know, Dieter, in fact, are, are, are so effective with our use of language and body language and, and how um, Jonathan was pointing out in the next one on his deal here on Thinker of Thoughts uh, where, where, where Jeffrey Holland is using fake emotions and he points out, you know, he mentions, you know, Henry B. Irene doing that and we've seen Gordon B. Hinckley doing that kind of a thing where they are faking emotions and using body language so effectively because they're NLP masters that these things send signals to our subconscious of um, of sincerity. Oh, look, he's tearing up. Oh, it looked like he, he was almost choking up there with emotion. He's so moved by the spirit. And these things authenticate within our minds. It says to us, this man is authentic. He's honest. He is truly a man of God. And I pointed this out like with uh, w w w the girl who, who did the, you know, she called herself Mormon girl, Mormon next door, the Mormon next door. And she does the did. She's just like vanished. The, um, you know what Mormons believe things and in that one that one where I've got her in the you know she's got that pink outfit on on the front of the video it's like number three and a thing about you know something to do with polygamy and so forth was, I did that you know, several months ago um, she uses a lot of techniques and I don't know if she learned by assimilation or actually has you know studied NLP but uh, she did several things to gain our trust uh, techniques that you know people that are are good sales people, sales techniques. She, she gives us something quickly that we can verify in our minds to know is true, a couple of things, and then to, and some body language that looks very authentic, which people like, you know, uh, Jeffrey Holland use and so forth.
This other one, uh, the one in the middle here, how Mormons believe the official polygamy story versus primary source information, I guess, something like that. Yeah, that was done, you know, right after that other one. So, uh, yeah, you know, they're okay. They're not the best thing they ever did, but I, I think I did, you know. I was pointing out how how they get us to believe this stuff, the, the way things are presented, the techniques that are used to pass this stuff off, which, you know, is, is nonsense if, if you have the correct information. And they've done, you know, they've limited our information plus used uh, persuasion techniques to do that in, in, in both of these videos here. Uh, techniques that, you know, people that are, are good sales people, sales techniques, she, she gives us something quickly that we can verify in our minds to know is true, a couple of things, and then to, and some body language that looks very authentic, which people like, you know, uh, Jeffrey Holland use and so forth. To give signals to us, and we, we say, okay, great, we've identified. She said something that we know is true. She said something else that we know is true, and now we're ready to trust her on something else. And so she gives us, like, she says, well, Joseph Smith was a reluctant polygamist, and, 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 and here's proof. And she shows, like, you know, for like four seconds, some letter written in cursive, which she says is evidence that Joseph Smith was a reluctant polygamist. He didn't really want to, you know, all that story that we all heard back in the day, it, you know, Joseph Smith really didn't want to hurt him his feelings, but the Lord commanded him to break his marriage covenants. Um, and so we see this, and, and, and so it's, oh, okay, that's, that's physical evidence. That's proof. You know, it's just like seeing the picture of Moroni in Joseph Smith's bedroom. You know, like like he's all alone. He's got his own bed and got his own room and stuff. You know, when it's like really like four brothers in there and, and two beds that they're sharing. You know, like, shh, Moroni, my brothers are sleeping. But, but, we, but we, what we do is we see that picture and it becomes real for our minds. Or we see the first vision picture and it becomes real for our minds. Or we see on LDS.org the newer video, it's a few months old now, where they have the composite narrative for people that know that, you know, this whole first vision story that you've heard was basically, you know, like one that came out years after the other ones came out, which came out long after it was, you know, supposed to have happened. It, depending on which year, you know, of age you said it was, was he 14, was he 16, was he, you know, 15, was he 17, what, you know, which version was it, who was there, was it Jesus, was he there because he knew there was no true church, or it was there because he thought there was one, or, you know, but he just wanted to ask, all these, you know, contradictions we've got, so what they do is they take a few aspects of these, and they do it just like they like the Christians have done, you know, and if you're Mormon, you, you think you're Christian nowadays, um, you know, the, in the harmonizing of the Gospels for the Christmas or, or the resurrection story, all that kind of stuff. And you take these these stories that have obvious contradictions and, and big problems in them uh, from Luke or Matthew and so forth. And you look, but what they've done is, is, is they create a story with, very, you know, with elements from all of them. And they say, this is the story. Give you a movie. It goes into your mind. And it's like, oh, that's the way it happened. You know, check out the facts and say, oh, wait a minute. This story says that the disciples were like in Jerusalem or something and Jesus appeared to them. Whereas you notice on the other one, no, they're out on, you know, whatever, Mount somewhere out in the wilderness and Jesus appears to them. And it's the same day and they obviously couldn't be in two places the same day or all kinds of things that are completely contradictory. You don't notice that they've just weaved together a new version for you, a composite narrative that brings together some elements of various accounts that have some common things but they also have some contradictory which they just get rid of sweep it under the rug so they did this with the first vision and created like a six minute video for you to watch and it's like oh it becomes real to you go straight into your subconscious but when you understand the sacrifice that is involved in the work of saving souls when we truly understand the value of a soul then we'll understand what jesus is talking about here it's because we don't understand the value of a soul yet we haven't truly understand what it means when Jesus says, except you eat my bread and drink my blood, you have no part with me. It's talking about self-sacrifice. It's talking about giving up what you want to do for what God needs you to do to build up his kingdom. The world is in utter confusion. What a blessing to know the truth. We rejoice in it. We have the truth on our lips. We have the truth around our hips. But how do we know we have the truth? Today we are millions, and on average, 
every weekend more than 5,000 are getting baptized. There are no other people on earth that are as spiritually free as we are. Some may say unity of belief, you're brainwashed. Well, we do agree that our thinking has been washed clean from the complicated doctrines that have evolved since Jesus walked the earth. And how encouraging it is to see young ones getting baptized, publicly demonstrating that they are giving their lives to Jehovah. And we sincerely hope that you young ones who are not yet baptized will not hold back from getting baptized as soon as you qualify. The sooner you can get baptized, the sooner you will receive greater protection and blessings from Jehovah. Not long ago, it made me very happy to observe a little 10-year-old brother get baptized. Okay, so this one we're listening to this JW guy preaching on JW TV or something. And he pulls a number of things here. Uh, first off, you know, he mentions, oh, people say that we're brainwashed. And then he, so he puts that out there and then says something completely, you know, idiotic. Oh, well, we're washed from the you know, complicated BS from the New Testament or something. I mean, it's complete nonsense, but as long as he acknowledges it and then puts it somewhere where he makes it okay, somehow, if you don't think, you know, then that's an inoculating technique. He, 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 I don't know, that, that was really lame, but that's what he did. And, and then he's encouraging 10-year-olds to get baptized, to make a, a commitment to step them on the way of commitment, commitment, commitment. It's a pattern that they use to get people in, to lock you in, to lock you in deeper, to lock you in deeper, you know. And so, right, like a 10-year-old's going to, you know, really comprehend all this stuff and they're going to, I mean, they're, like they really comprehend the level of commitment that goes on there and they're just going to be pushed in deeper and deeper and deeper into servitude for this multinational, multi-billion dollar corporation that's basically enslaving people by telling them that they can keep their family together forever and live together forever on the earth or some, you know, whatever their reward is, which beats the hell out of rotting in the ground and getting eaten by maggots and worms and stuff, okay? So we've got the carrot and the stick, and you obey us. That ha it happens. Otherwise, you know you're going to be you're going to be, you know, not even resurrected. You're just going to be dead and lose everything. It's going to totally suck. So, listen to us, step by step. They get you in deeper and deeper, encouraging little children to make a, you know a type of contract. There's finances involved. There's labor. There's all kinds of stuff. Now, normally in society, you got to be like 18 years old for this stuff. But no, not in religion. They get the free pass to freaking abuse all these people. Get children into contracts where they're stealing their money. Pieces of crap. I hate these leaders. As you get older, you are responsible. Remember the nice demo? We've mentioned that before. Well, I'm not ready to get baptized. Okay, let's hold off on your driver's license. What? I'm 16, what are you talking about? I'm ready, I know I'm ready. Yeah, you're ready for a driver's license, but you're not ready to dedicate your life. Hmm. Explain that one to heaven. Okay, so these guys don't follow Lucifer's plan, huh? Complete and total coercion. So this guy's suggesting that other parents uh, manipulate their children through like, hey, you can't drive, etc., uh, unless you adopt this religion and, and unless you um, they're blackmailing them into joining their church how what anyway I, I'll just stop because I'm, I'm getting pissed at this point somebody needs to kick this guy's teeth in and I'd be more than happy to do it he's a piece of crap that's horrendous the manipulation to get them to join their filthy religion Now before we hear from our speakers this morning, may I mention a matter close to my heart and which deserves our serious attention. I speak of missionary work. First two young men of the Aaronic Priesthood and two you young men who are becoming elders, I repeat what prophets have long taught that every worthy, able young man should prepare to serve a mission. 
Young man, I admonish you to prepare for service as a missionary, which is available. Participate in seminary or institute. Familiarize yourself with a missionary handbook. Preach my gospel. I word to you, young sisters, while you do not have the same priesthood responsibility as do the young men to serve as full-time missionaries, you also make a valuable contribution as missionaries, and we welcome your service. Missionary service is a priesthood duty, an obligation the Lord expects of us who've been given so very much. Okay, so here's Mons and the Master Manipulator here uh, doing even worse. Uh, it, Telling the, the young men, the boys, you know, the Mormon boys, that they are obligated, uh, that the uh, Sky Daddy, you know, that they owe him everything for their, all the wonders that he's done for them. So they, they need to uh, prepare to be slaves for the for a two-year period full-time, and they'll have to pay for it themselves, and they'll have to pay for it with what's left of the money they earn to pay for it after they pay freaking tithing to pieces of shit. It makes me so gosh darn angry, I can't even... It's filthy. So they give them this this BS about, oh, that their imaginary God, and he's been so kind, and all you got to do is read what a piece of crap, he's a freaking psychopathic murderer all through the Bible. But we, he, he's, Tommy and the turd burglars say that he's awesome, you know, and it's your priesthood duty. If you don't do it, then you're just a piece of crap, and no decent Mormon girl's going to marry you because they hear it all... You know, they hear it for years in young women that they need to wait for a good return missionary because that's anybody else's second-class citizen. They're not worthy. They didn't fulfill their duty. Same kind of shit they pull about joining the military-industrial complex and going meet murder people all across the globe. Oh, did you expect someone to be nice and soft-spoken? Sorry, I'm, I'm not knocking Dan Vogel and, you know, Jonathan and the people, but, uh, or Flackerman, but... I've seen a lot of loss and I'm pissed. So, yeah, Tommy. Burn in the belly of Moloch. I am so thankful to Jehovah that positive peer pressure was put on me to enter the pioneer ministry right out of high school. What a blessing and a protection it was to enter the regular pioneer work at age 17 and to be able to go to Bethel at 18. Even though there was considerable worldly pressure put on me to pursue university education, I am so happy that with Jehovah's help, I decided to build my future with Jehovah. Jesus said unto him, let the dead bury their dead, but go thou and preach the kingdom of God. We haven't truly understand what it means when Jesus says, except you eat my bread and drink my blood, you have no part with me. It's talking about self-sacrifice. It's talking about giving up what you want to do for what God needs you to do to build up his kingdom. Explain that one to heaven. For one here, so the JW guy's grateful that... Uh, he got pressured into servitude for uh, the watchtower, you know. Like I was just saying, you know, the Mormon boys that, you know, uh, the pressure that they feel and if they've got the integrity to say, you know what, um, I don't believe this shit and I'm not going to go tell people I do. I'm not going to gain a testimony by bearing one or tape record myself tape record, whatever, record myself reading Joseph Smith's testimony in my own voice and listen to it over and over until the spirit testifies to me that it's true because that helps the spirit according to, was it Christofferson? If that's not freaking mind wash, anybody who thinks that's like some Holy Spirit, not that there isn't a spiritual world, you know, anybody knows that I believe that there is one, but I don't think that the ghost is any good and uh, I know that that's a the flat mind control technique. And then here we got this guy who's with SDA, Seventh-day Adventist. And sorry, pal, but, uh, you know, any religion that believes that they got to cannibalize, drink blood and shit like that is screwed up. That whole Catholic transubstantiation bullshit that they got from, you know, 
where the hell they got that, you know, three religions back before Judaism is, is just so sick, you know, it's a, a magical, you know, a, a priest practicing magic to turn the wafer thingy in Donald Trump language into actual flesh of a human being that was half God and was murdered so that God would accept us back. The sickness of this whole idiotic plan is so... How, how do you describe it without using, you know, language like worse than I already am? It's mind-boggling. Anyway, moving right along. It's necessary to defend the truth because in today's world, truth is being attacked and distorted. We are surrounded by a sea of lies and misrepresentations, but we should not be gullible and believe everything newspapers write or everything we hear on radio or see on television. So beware of the mass media, and when they say negative things about God's organization, remember whose media it is. Why would you believe something in the newspaper that's uh, accusing God's organization of something? And believe it? That's sad. Whose media is it? Satan's media. Uh, anyone who truly knows Jehovah's Witnesses recognizes that all of these accusations are completely ridiculous. But the murderous hatred that Satan the devil has for all faithful servants of Jehovah God is still very much active in this earth. Okay, rapid fire analysis. So what, he's using the, uh, oh, persecuted martyr complex BS. Uh, we're just, you know, being persecuted by Satan. Of course, it's it's ridiculous uh, to to think that we're a bunch of freaking pedophile priests like like they are. So, um, I'm unstinkable. Yeah, it's Satan's media. It's the devil trying to deceive you. We don't tickle boys' tadpoles. What woman would be interested in this freak anyway, right? So. He's a, probably a predator himself. Ian doing the name calling. We're the good guys, they're the bad guys. He's saying we're just being persecuted. We faithfully follow Jehovah God. And uh, Satan is causing people to persecute them, so they're all haters. You know, so the, the name calling, whether it's the liberal media saying you're a bigot, you're, you're a hater, or whether it's the church is saying they're hateful apostates, critics. Somebody just needs to slap this boy, and I mean hard. Facing the problem of sexual abuses committed by priests, the Pope has asked for clarity. That's what two psychologist priests hope to find with the book, The Church and Pedophilia, An Open Wound. He's a priest focused on himself. The authors say some of the symptoms leaders should have in mind include the concept the priest has of his power and his interactions with adults. If he lacks the capacity to interact in a normal way with people his own age, they say he could try to fill the void by abusing children. Kuchi and Zollner say this is a serious pathology, but that it can be detected and in some cases redirected if educators know when and what to ask future priests. The pair of psychologists and professors at the Gregorian Pontifical University are publishing their conclusions after several years of study. Explain that one to heaven. I was, okay, abused by a government worker when I was about 11 years old, okay? And I won't go into the details about it, but it was a pedophilic situation. And it was only because of a state senator who got involved in it that got me out of the situation. And I went into a Mormon church, former general authority, who wanted to admit to me what the church had been doing to me, the LDS church. And I'm not going to go into all the particulars. But basically, I, I recorded him without him realizing I did it. And after certain things happened uh, over the course of, of some years where there, I was still a target of these people, uh, I finally went to the FBI and gave them the tape. And the, term, the, the, the agent's name was Johnny Turner. Okay? Now, this is after I'd worked with the FBI on other things when I was in the Army and as a police officer, so I knew the problems with them. And I said to Agent Johnny Turner, who's a good, great man, by the way, I'm going to give him a lot of credit, 
I told him, I said, well, you know, because he was saying, oh, we're the FBI, we'll make sure it happens. I said, no, no, I, I know what this is like. This is a political thing. And this is gonna, you're gonna, your people in D.C. are going to end up trying to cover this up. After he listened to the tape, he, he, put it, he put the earphones in. I said, that's the best evidence of a civil rights violation I have ever seen that the LDS Church's security had, had done to me, who a lot of these people are former FBI agents, CIA, Secret Service, etc. Okay, well, guess what happened to the, the, the general authority? His name was George P. Lee. After this was given to the FBI, and I did George P. Lee a disservice here, and I mentioned it in my book. They accused him of the same pedophilia that they engage in. Why do I met some of the top leaders in the church and throughout? Why do I say that? 1991, Elder Pace reveals it in a memo to the First Presidency. It's squashed, and he's sent off on a mission somewhere. I got involved in the Franklin cover-up with Senator DeCamp. I don't know if he'll remember when he called me and he asked me to send him some information on a photo lineup that had specific church members in the photo lineup. Church members, church leaders. Explain that one to heaven. Further, this evidence on the on the Franklin cover-up thing also brought in, of course, a lot of political figures that, that we know as household names today. So there it is. Yes, I do have the evidence. I was even privy to uh, uh, a court document that came in from California uh, that was going to charge a... Uh, at the discovery at that point of a leading church official in the eldest church. I mean a leading one who had been accused of, of, of abusing his granddaughter. And I still have that, that court document. The Mormon church is getting some potentially unwanted attention after the launch of a new WikiLeaks-style website designed to shine a light into the internal dealings and financial workings of the institution. The website is called Mormon WikiLeaks, and it provides an encrypted portal for individuals to upload documents, videos, or any other information they wish to leak related to the Mormon church. It was created by Ryan McKnight, a former member of the church, who helped expose the controversial November policy, a homophobic and discriminatory practice that banned the baptisms of any children with LGBT parents. I was not the leaker of that document, but I basically played a role in in bringing it to the attention of the public. Following the leak, hundreds of followers reportedly left the church. Explain that one to heaven. His goal is ultimately more transparency. Well, the LDS Church, in my opinion, and in the opinion of many, falls short in their responsibilities to their stakeholders uh, for transparency. Um, and that obviously involves financial information, but not only that, um, also just their policies and procedures of the corp at the corporate level. Um, uh, most a average members are not aware of, of how things work in this organization that they're supporting financially. I contacted the LDS Church's Public Affairs Department in Salt Lake City. They told me that while they are aware of the new website, the church is choosing to not make any official statement on the matter. In Washington, Manuel Rapolo, RT. Whose media is it? Satan's media. All of these accusations are completely ridiculous. But the murderous hatred that Satan the devil has for all faithful servants of Jehovah God is still very much active in this earth. Hold on with both hands. Stick with what we have authorized. You'll be safe. You want to go out there, it's at your spiritual risk. Keep the eyes of the mission on the leaders of the church. We will not and cannot lead you astray. We sincerely thank you for your generous support of Jehovah's great work in these exciting last days. As we all know, it is 
difficult enough to sort out the truth from our own experiences. To make matters worse, we have an adversary, the devil, who as a roaring lion walketh about seeking whom he may devour. Satan is the great deceiver, the accuser of the brethren, the father of all lies. For those who already embrace the truth, his primary strategy is to spread the seeds of doubt. For example, he has caused many members of the church to stumble when they discover information about the church that seems to contradict what they had learned previously. If you experience such a moment, remember that in this age of information, there are many who create doubt about anything and everything, at any time and every place. You will find even those who still claim that they have evidence that the earth is flat. Explain that one to heaven. That the moon is a hologram. <laughs> it looks like it a little bit, right? Yeah. <laughs> and that certain movie stars are really aliens from another planet. And it is always good to keep in mind just because something is printed on paper, appears on the internet, is frequently repeated, or has a powerful group of followers, doesn't make it true. Sometimes untrue claims or information are presented in such a way that they appear quite credible. However, when you are confronted with information, that is in conflict with the revealed word of God. Remember, we simply don't know all things. We can't see everything. What may seem contradictory now may be perfectly understandable as we search for and receive more trustworthy information. Explain that one to heaven. So don't be bogged down on these apostates and be careful on the internet uh, we were talking about that this weekend with friends oh, my word uh, how many times do I have to tell you be careful you know going here going there they'll suck you in see uh, with some of this stuff it can seem so innocent we're just warning you that's all we can do is admonish stick with what we have authorized you'll be safe Satan is a malicious liar he is the champion of the lie. Since Jehovah hates liars, we should avoid all lies. It is true that Satan, the demons, and this world are against you. Jehovah loves you very much. The governing body loves you very much. The elders love you very much. Your Christian parents love you very much. And these ones will tell you the truth even though at times it may not be what you want to hear. They will not tickle your ears, perhaps like ones at school or in the neighborhood, who don't really love you or have your best interest at heart. But please believe those who will tell you the truth because they love you. My son, when we tell you to do something, it's because we love you. We want the best for you. If we are in continued association with those who do not believe the same, it can erode our thinking and convictions. Listen to how the Jehovah's Witness leaders instill phobias towards people who have left their organization, some of which may have joined the Latter-day Saints. This is from their 2013 district convention. Like Satan, human apostates are unruly men who cook up wicked reasonings and season their brew with poisonous lies that deceive minds. Apostates are mentally diseased, and they try to infect others with their disloyal teaching. So avoiding apostates means that we will not allow them into our homes by reading their literature, watching TV programs that feature them, examining their websites, or adding our comments to their blogs. 
apostates are not sincere in their expressions. Their aim is to manipulate your mind and undermine your faith. They are liars and deceivers bent on destroying your relationship with Jehovah God and His Son, Christ Jesus. My son, when we tell you to do something, it's because we love you. We want the best for you. teaches that God will manifest the truth of spiritual things unto us by the power of the Holy Ghost. In modern revelation, God promises us that we will receive knowledge by his telling us in our mind and in our heart by the Holy Ghost. When you learn to control your thoughts, you will be saved. The world is in utter confusion. What a blessing to know the truth. Because of the wave of confusion and doubts being promoted by the world today, we must hold ever more tightly to our testimony of the restor restored gospel of Jesus Christ. But we should not be gullible and believe everything newspapers write or everything we hear on radio or see on television. Satan is the great deceiver, the accuser of the brethren. And it is always good to keep in mind, just because something is printed on paper, appears on the internet, is frequently repeated, or has a powerful group of followers, doesn't make it true. Sometimes untrue claims or information are presented in such a way that they appear quite credible. However, when you are confronted with information that is in conflict with the revealed word of God, remember that the blind man in the parable of the elephant would never be able to accurately describe the full truth. We simply don't know all things. We can't see everything. What may seem contradictory now may be perfectly understandable as we search for and receive more trustworthy information. Hey, just a quick warning, right after Dita here, uh, after just a couple seconds, it's going to show some Book of Abraham stuff. Not this, but the facsimile to figure seven, which is obscene. It is in your scriptures, but you know, you might not want to expose somebody to it that uh, you hadn't told that, you know, about the birds and the bees or, you know, it's anyway. Uh, it's there, you know, right side up instead of upside down. Vulgar, in my opinion, it is in your scriptures. Quick warning. So that's going right up uh, in about, you know, a couple, like five seconds after this. And then at about 117 and change, as soon as the guy getting done with the BYU talks over, uh, you know, in his, in his college, whatever stuff, um, graduation, then there's, you know, like about two seconds of it with Raz. Rasmond or whatever his name is showing some book of Abraham stuff that it's, it's explicit it's in your scriptures but it's explicit just quick warning you can skip it if you want uh, how many times did I tell you be careful that internet information does not have a truth filter some information no matter how convincing is simply not true it is true that Satan, the demons, and this world are against you. We speak boldly because Satan is a real being set on destroying you. And you face his influence at a younger and younger age. You see, as a result of remaining faithful, uh, the remaining anointed ones who are on the earth and all of those who associate with them and who support them in their work are in a war, a literal war against Satan the devil and the wicked spirit forces. 
I believe Satan's ever-expanding efforts are some proof of the truthfulness of this work. Satan especially desires to deceive the Latter-day Saints, those who know the truth about him. When someone becomes a dedicated and baptized servant of Jehovah, we want him to stay closely attached to the organization. Yet every year, there are a number who stop attending meetings and become inactive. A few of you may have run into some who have ceased to hold fast to the iron rod, wandered off the straight and narrow path, and have become lost. Okay, here, so we're like at a, coming up, but it'll be like a minute and whatever. It was a minute and seven and 20 seconds before I add this in before it. So I'm putting this in at the end of, you know, the guy speaking is a little in the graduation gear there, you know. Must be a BYU thing. So the next one's going to be like Elder Rasmin or whatever his name is, you know. A newer apostle, bald dude, almost. Okay, so I'm going to take something out of the Book of Abraham, facsimile 2, figure 7, and it is obscene. And instead of being upside down, it's right side up. And instead of being microscopic, it's a little easier to see. And it's totally freaking pornographic hieroglyphic. So uh, if you want to skip over that, <coughs> this is your warning. This is in your scriptures, <clears throat> but you might not notice it. But if your you know, children happen to examine the hieroglyphics by magnifying glass, um, then they'd see this. So it's, you know, it's Elohim. According to Joseph Smith, it's, you know, according to Egypt Halls, it's just it's Pharaoh, and there's like a bird near him or some stuff like that. But with, you know, Joseph Smith, it's, you know, Elohim, God the Father, the Holy Ghost, and, 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 and Abraham, like talking about the priesthood keys and grand keywords and all this kind of, you know, BS that you get out of like Freemasonry and crap, and that kind of language. But Elohim uh, forgot to put his pants on, and it looks like he's got caught at the movies or something pulling a Pee Wee Herman so it's it's pretty graphic and pretty disgusting and um, it's in your scriptures and that's what Joseph Smith that says you know your God is that you worship if you're LDS of course I didn't realize that because it's small and upside down and you know I just never noticed that I mean I actually had looked at those things because you know there's the three facts and they talk about you know some of them are like not yet interpreted and all this stuff and you're looking for all the kinds of information you could get that would make you closer to God, you know, like fasting every time you go to the temple and stuff like that, but anyway, um, somehow I didn't notice that. <laughs> That's one thing I got out of the CES letter that I didn't know beforehand. Um, <laughs> there were probably a few things. I hadn't paid attention to Numbers chapter 31, really. Of course, I could have got that out of Age of Reason, but I hadn't read that at, the, at that point, but I stumbled on it later. Too busy reading church books, yeah, I don't know. I had found out a lot of things, but, uh, so, yeah, God, the total stinking pervert, he's talking to two dudes, and he's, um, in a state of, uh, readiness for reproduction on Kolob, or nearby, that's definitely not a, not, you know, who, who, who talks to two other dudes while they're in, no, you know, like if his wife just, you know, left or something, and guy OD'd on Cialis or something, but he's just hanging out with the boys and uh, admiring his need for circumcision or something. I don't know. It's disgusting. Um, at least <laughs> you'd think so. So um, there's your warning, and to me that kind of helps sum things up of how screwed up this whole theology is. What... <laughs> Seriously, this is like God, the holiest of all, and he's sitting there looking like Pee Wee Herman got caught, caught in the movies whacking it. <laughs> oh, God. you got to be kidding me, right? But no. That's what Joseph Smith says right in there. You see the JST translation, or JST. There's only one translation. Oh, in the LDS scriptures. Of course, there's what the Egyptologists say, and it's, you know, it's Pharaoh, and... Why he's pictured that way is beyond me, but uh, he, he has some uh, modesty issues, evidently, of his own. <clears throat> but uh, at least he, he wasn't talking to the boys, uh, according to him. He's like waiting for his concubine to come visit him or something. I don't know. Okay. Um, <clears throat> this is your God, Mormons. He is a pervert. <clears throat> 
Yeah. Tommy and the Turd Burglars. I want to rock. I don't want to roll with Tommy and the Turd Burglars. Okay, so you'll have about 10 seconds to prepare now for Rated R from Colob. We're straight out of Colob. They're actually going to say, hold on to the iron rod and magnifying your shortcomings. You can't actually even make this kind of crap up. Here it comes. It's only a couple seconds, but blink if you need to. Elohim, the perv. A few of you may have run into some who have ceased to hold fast to the iron rod, wandered off the straight and narrow path, and have become lost. Some have immersed themselves in internet materials that magnify, exaggerate, and in some cases invent shortcomings of early church leaders. Then they draw incorrect conclusions that can affect testimony. Well, I'm not going to lie, that actually would affect my testimony if I hadn't already been aware of the <laughs> screwed upness of uh, this whole deal. So, uh, thanks, uh, Elder Apostle uh, Rasmund. You uh, hit the nail on the head with that one. Apostates do not drift away from the truth. They deliberately decide to go out from among God's people. They leave the old ship Zion. They fall away. They apostatize. Tragically, they often experience short-term and eventually long-term unintended consequences. Apostates are not sincere in their expressions. Their aim is to manipulate your mind and undermine your faith. They are liars and deceivers bent on destroying your relationship with Jehovah God and his son Christ Jesus. And Satan's goal is not complete when a person leaves the church, but when he comes out in open rebellion against it. Those who have had a family member disfellowship likened it to the deepest hurt that they've ever experienced. However, we must not allow strong family ties to compromise loyalty to Jehovah and to his organization. We should disconnect immediately and completely from listening to the proselytizing efforts of those who have lost their faith and instead reconnect promptly with the Holy Spirit. Human apostates are mentally diseased and they try to infect others with their disloyal teachings. With good reason, then, the Bible tells us to avoid apostates just as we would avoid a person who was infected with a contagious, deadly disease. Studying the church through the eyes of its defectors, Elder Neil A. Maxwell once said, is like interviewing Judas to understand Jesus. Same chapter, verse 17, notice what it says. The Bible says, Now I beseech you, brethren, Mark them which cause divisions and offenses contrary to the what? What is the doctrine that we've been given? The three angels' message. So anybody that causes a, causes a division that's contrary to the doctrine, there, you, it's, notice what it says you ought to do. It says, contrary to the doctrine which ye have learned, and avoid them. You are to mark them and avoid them. Who's that, Ted Wilson? Who, any other pastor, preacher, doesn't matter who we... Any, anyone else who is causing a division contrary to the doctrine that you have been taught, you are to mark them and avoid them. That's what the Bible says. That's what the Bible says. So when we look at these things, brothers and sisters, this is clear Bible that you are to have a Protestant experience. You are to avoid these individuals that are leading you in a false path. What's a false path? A church with a drum. A church where they're singing and dancing. A church where they're Talking about singing Kirk Franklin, Donnie McKirkland, and all these Babylonian songs that is being sung in God's professed church. Because here, here's what we have to understand, brothers and sisters. This is why Jesus died. Jesus gave his life to remove sin. So if sin is brought in and nobody says anything, we are okaying it. This is, the, this is the issue. This is why Jesus died. When we understand the value of the cross, the, it, we will understand we have to say something for Jesus. We have to say something. We can't sit there silently. Satan is trying to work from the inside.
to weaken the church through dissension, discord, and conformity to the world. It is little wonder then that Satan is doing everything he can to attack the Seventh-day Adventist movement. I really honestly loved being a Seventh-day Adventist. There was, I was very involved in the church. I, I wrote for the church. Uh, I was uh, very active in, in Sabbath school. I was in choir. I was so active, and I actually loved it. It's just there were some things that bothered me on the side. When you're told that everyone out there is going to be deceived by the Antichrist, you alone, you better cling with all your heart to these, these principles and these things you've been taught, or you're going to be deceived. And then at one point, my husband and I just looked at each other and we said, this is just so wrong. <laughs> this is just so wrong, we have to leave. And so just in faith, but it, it really broke my heart. I knew that it was traumatizing my family and my, and my uh, brothers and sisters. And it Because was, you were vocal about some of these things you were discovering. And well, I wanted them to know yeah. why we were leaving. That it wasn't because Adventists believe you can, you don't leave the church for doctrinal reasons. That you leave it because you've been hurt. Somebody hurt you. The amazing thing about this uh, manipulation through mind control is that people can realize that they're being manipulated at times and get out of a particular organization and then hear this Seventh day Adventist gal here uh, and her husband, um, have, you know, they, they bailed the SDA church. And yet she's here talking, she's on Catholic apologetics with this guy, you know, and I would imagine their church demonized the Catholic church as it well deserves, just like, uh, you know, the Book of Mormon does, because burning people at the stake, you know, your missionary program is massacring anyone who doesn't disagree with you, and that's supposed to be, well, that is, lines up pretty well with Yahweh, it's the way Yahweh always was in the Old Testament, too, he's consistent at least, he's always horrendous, but to try to pass him off as, as, as a good, you know, perfected being. God, you know, is, um, <laughs> it's unbelievable what they market this guy is. And in the Catholic history is, is you know, Moses may have been make-believe, but the Crusades and the, and, the, and the Inquisitions were not. And what they did to the American Indians or Native Americans, you know, it's not. They, they, they're just, you know, roasting people, slow cooking them and unbelievable. And here this gal is going to that. They can discover that their church is full of it, but somehow they miss out that, this guy says he re you know, he represents God's holy priesthood, and they like roast people that don't go along with their church doctrine when they had the opportunity to. Well, the only reason they're not doing it now is because uh, the way the law reads, I suppose. I mean, give me a break. <laughs> it's uh, it's just hard to believe how people can see it in one thing and not in another. That's all. That that's what I wanted to say there. Then again, with the little amount that we saw of her um, she's not talking about mind control she's talking about you know doctrinal issues or something possibly so maybe she didn't realize uh, how it was they got manipulated into such ridiculous stuff but she saw that it was asinine so how could she not see the Catholicism is as well hey it's a mystery just like uh, the Catholic God and all the rest of them a lot of people will accuse a former Adventist of hating or having a grudge against uh, Seventh-day Adventists, which is absolutely not true. Yeah, as soon as we discovered things about the Watchtower and the UN Association, uh, the failed false prophecies, uh, the Bible changes, the new light, and so on, we just thought, oh, we can't do this anymore. We can't go to the meetings. possible if I can still worship Jehovah without... Being believing. a Jehovah's Witness? Yeah, and following the faithful and discreet slave, and he said, no, that's impossible. You can't do that. They, they both go hand in hand. We did not believe that Jehovah's Witnesses have the truth. So yeah. we didn't go. But we got to fellowship for having doubts. Yeah, we've lost all of our Jehovah's Witness family and friends. We're being shunned like any most ex-Jehovah's Witnesses. We would never be able to be witnesses again knowing the reality behind it. There's just no way. I, I could never close my eyes again. I got baptized as a very, very young person. I had no idea the implications that would come from this. The, I had no idea. Um, what I was getting into. I didn't know that if I changed my mind once I became an adult, 
once I had my own thought process um, that I would lose my entire family over. It's no wonder that witnesses are commanded to stay off of the internet, to uh, only go to one particular website, and we know which website that is, the one that's owned by them. I'm only interested in reporting truth about the organization that has taken more than 20 years of my life uh, and continues to hold my family hostage. You're only going to know the full picture once you start doing objective research, which is what I encourage people to do. That is not preying on Jehovah's Witnesses. And there was a few times for about two years where I was voiced that I was having doubts about being here, and they would just say, well, the only reason you want to leave is because you've committed crimes here. So you feel bad and you want to run away. So I would, oh, you're right. And that's, I convinced myself of that too. Like, if I want to leave, it's because I've done something wrong and it's my fault. And, and then you get all into your head, like, there must be something really wrong with me. And it's really depressing. It's their doctrine or the highway. If you don't agree with Scientology teachings, you know, you either have a word that you don't understand or it's because you've done something bad. Haggis was stunned when he reviewed the material for OT3. And I read the materials, they're handwritten by, by Hubbard. And I went, what the hell is this? I mean, I could justify a lot of things in the past, and I could uh, say, okay, but this, this, there's nothing to justify. This is, damn, this is, insane. this is madness. This is absolute madness. It's, uh, it's a system of belief that, I mean, you've got these folks inside this fortress who, who won't look out and won't look at any criticism and can't bear to, 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 to any investigation and, and think that everyone is against them. How would you describe that? Um, two sisters who are in the church yeah can't speak with them no. they won't speak with you no what is it like not being able to even call or it's email it's horrible your own flesh and blood it's wrong like many members I I it was important for me, it was my career, and it was also what I truly felt in my heart to have these kinds of encounters with apologists and my own personal studies that could help me say, I may not fully understand it, but I have faith, and my faith will bridge the gap and I'll put it on a shelf. Because as a teacher, I needed to be aware of what the um, critics were saying. I needed to be able to refute that, and if my students brought up questions or they brought me a pamphlet and said, my friend gave me this, he's a member of the Assembly of God or whatever, how do you respond to this? Because I couldn't reconcile what I was discovering historically and doctrinally about the, the church with this claim that we are the one true church, the true and living church. And, and more than that, I felt like I had, I felt betrayed um, by the very people that I had trusted the most. I just, I, I felt like, just tell me the truth. And then tell me what really happened at Carthage. And then I'll decide for myself. I went to all the Mormon scholars that I could. I wanted to know what the church had to say about these things. And I asked them all basically the same question. First of all, is this that I've been reading true? And invariably, every single one of them would say, well, not only is that true, but... Blah, 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 and they'd tell me something else that I didn't know that was just even more shocking. It just kind of said, it made me see that the church was did not have this right. Uh, we weren't, we didn't have it right when it came to the treatment of our LGBT brothers and sisters. And so, it just kind of started me down a path, it was the catalyst, down a path of like, how can we be wrong about anything? <laughs> what else are we wrong about? Um, and I just started doing some research and found a lot of just, uh, discrepancies in the between what I've been taught all my life and what I've read and researched with history. To know I need the strength to accept the truth. The church says it is trying to be transparent and that believers in every church have doubts. But when Mr. Matson brought his questions to his superiors, he says they told him to stay silent. They said that you're not supposed to talk to your wife, your children, you don't to talk about these issues in church. Hans Matson says he is not alone in suffering a crisis of faith and that there are consequences. 
Mormons who admit their doubts can be prohibited from attending weddings and baptisms, and friends and family members sometimes cut off contact. Really, why I'm sitting here and why I'm here in the United States is because I can see that there are so many friends of mine, members in the church, that are being hurt. They have, they're going through a terrible faith crisis, as I did. I just always thought, you know, anti-Mormon literature is just a crappy way to, you know, like take bits and pieces of the truth. But now that the LDS scholars are acknowledging things that I had never in my life of devouted Mormonism had never ever heard of. I, I was like, I feel like I couldn't trust them. We just needed to keep learning. We got to the point where we were like, we just want the truth. Just give us the hard, heavy truth, but just let it be the truth. You know, that's all, that's all we want. If you're watching this video, surely you are an adult. You have the tools that you need to make your own decisions in life and not have eight men determining and micromanaging every single facet of, how, of the decisions you make and the life choices you make. Doubt your doubts before you doubt your faith. Hold fast to the truth as to a lifeline, as this is what it is. Stay in the boat. Use your life jackets. Hold on with both hands. Stick with what we have authorized. You'll be safe. So if I think of, you know, so now we've got how they manipulate these narratives to adapt to changing, um, you know, information and belief systems that people have got. So for instance, if we look at the Book of Mormon, okay, we may notice, hey, there are all kinds of contradictions in here. Jesus can't keep his story straight. Joseph Smith can't. So whoever wrote this thing can't keep their story straight, sometimes from one verse to the next. You know, and there are obvious contradictions or, or places where evidently they didn't have an eraser or a microprocessor, you know, or whatever. They couldn't just, like, edit that out. And so they, like, have to change what they're saying. And they got something stupid in there, like, you know, they were protected from the more vital, vital parts of the body. And then the next verse says, or rather, the more vital parts of the body were protected from the weapons of the Lamanites. And you're like, huh? But, you know, obviously, if he was getting this off of a stone that didn't, you know, have the letter, the words disappear until he got it correct, he wouldn't have that kind of a mistake. So, you know, like when Sean McCraney says, this is a good example of where it looks like he was using an outline and then they had to make a correction, but they can't erase this stuff. They got, you know, pens. They just like, sometimes or sometimes they just continue right on and correct something idiotic in the next verse. And, and this happens, you know, various times in the Book of Mormon, or he'll say something ridiculous like 2 Nephi 5, 15, 16. And it's funny, the way he says it, whoever it's supposed to be, Nephi, you know, he's saying, we had gold and silver and precious ores. And? And what? What, what, what precious ores are there in addition to gold and silver that are like, you know, as or more precious. I don't know. But, you know, he talks, he says, we've got all this thing in abundance. And then the very next verse, he says, so we started building a temple like the Temple of Solomon, but we couldn't build it right, really like it because we didn't have any precious stuff to put in it. And we're like, dude, you left it in the last verse. I mean, come on. Time after time, we see these idiotic things in there that wouldn't come from an all-knowing God. And the translation process as described on the stone doesn't doesn't work because you know, like you know supposedly the words wouldn't disappear until it was everything was corrected you know, correctly written by Oliver Cowdery it's ridiculous so now if we look at the problem of so Joseph Smith's coming up with all this stuff that he publishes and we don't know what the sources are so various people have said oh it looks like Spalding it looks like view of the Hebrews it looks like you know uh, the late war it looks like you know uh, the first book of Napoleon or um, or, or now, you know, it looks like some things from the travels of Marco Polo and various other travel logs and all kinds of, you know, the conquest of Mexico. And so there are all sorts of potential sources or, you know, what, what are some of the, uh, the Masonic elements that are in there um, or, and, and, you know, things from the occult that are written in there and in like, you know, in the book of Moses, like chapter five, chapter seven. And, and you say, where is this stuff coming from? 
Well, we don't know exactly where everything came from, so people try to... So, so we've got your Hugh Nibbleys out there and, and, and their protégés that give us the false model that says, well, it must be true unless you can show exactly where it came from. We don't have to know where it came from. But they did present something to the people back in the day to say, this is how we got it, and it's from God. And that's, that has been a continuing model, but they've changed some of the specifics regarding it. So what's been emphasized is it was given through the gift and power of God. However, and so that's why you can't explain it. That's why Joseph Smith knew this or this or this that he probably shouldn't have known. You know, he didn't know where Nahum was or he didn't know, you know, that they had build buildings out of cement or something that would give some sort of... Um, credibility just like the whole thing saying here's where the american indians came from we're providing an answer therefore it is from god because he couldn't have known these things the the, the you know the the american indians came from israel they're a lost tribe of israel and here's why they got such a good tan god just got you know upset with him and gave him a dark tan so that the delights him white and delights him nephites wouldn't mix with him so we've got a story that covers where how we get a different race in the americas that doesn't conflict with the Genesis narrative. Of course, that's kind of gotten screwed over with the whole DNA thing, but they try to avoid some of the, some of the implications of that, like these people had to come before Adam and live through the flood that they preach as an actual event. So they try to just avoid those things and steer, guide you through this um, <laughs> skillfully. So at the time, the explanation was acceptable to say, well, he was using, you know, various, um, magical um, implements uh, first they've, they've got the story He's, they've gotten the whole um, you know magic glasses written in ether chapter 3 and then they also have the magic seer stone written into Alma I think and Messiah's got it that it reveal, brings you know the works of darkness into light so it's like a crystal ball kind of a thing which was more acceptable at that time because it seems that the culture as, as, as we read um, many people uh, were able to mix, you know, mesh um, aspects of the occult um, and the magic arts with Christianity acceptably. That was okay for some of these new religions coming out or these new, you know, blends of doctrine and so forth. They were using um, supernatural things as evidence, like in, in, in some of these, uh, uh, you know, revivals that we, that we read about occurring in the, in the days in the burned over district and so forth if you, if you read about those revivals i'm not talking about like through church you know literature or something but actually just read the historical stuff about these you will see that there's a lot of supernatural stuff going on people going into trances and doing all kinds of weird stuff that basically born again christians do some of the time you know or speaking in tongues or dancing in trances for hours and then they talk about some of the bad things that were going on you know associated like brothels like hanging out near these camps and lots of babies appearing nine months later and the kind of thing that you'd read about in ancient christian things. You know, I mean, Christmas was illegal, right? I mean, like the Roman Empire had to ban it for a while because it was just so completely out of control. It's like being in a Latin country where they have these festivals and, you know, they got a cardinal from the, you know, Catholic Church overseeing what's going on for three days of complete hedonism, you know, in, in, in a city or something, and, and everybody's drunk and everybody's with everybody and there's a lot of babies nine months later. Just completely nuts. And you've got you know, a representative of the Catholic Church basically overseeing one of these festivals for one of their saints. It's completely nuts. If you're American, you're like, what? Um, anyway, yeah, that's a reality. So apparently it got so, so wild in the streets, you know, from Christianity early on that, that this, you know, was actually illegal for a while. It was a holiday that was banned, but it was just out of control. And the Roman Church basically brought in elements from various other uh, religious uh, orientations, you know, that we call pagan and so forth, which actually Christianity sort of had developed into it, or Christianity, Judaism, you know, through Zoroastrianism and, and, and all these things that eventually, if you go back far enough, it all deals with, you know, the sun and, and you know, crops and, you know, the things that bring life, astrology, these kinds of things are elements of, you know, Judaism, Kabbalistic Judaism, Zoroastrianism from, you know, um, your other source, and e Egyptian and Babylonian stuff being brought, brought into the Christian theology that was brought in to calm the Jews down so they wouldn't be looking for, you know, a, a warrior hero, Messiah. Um, 
so, you know, you see, well, we've got Easter, you know, which is a, a fertility thing. <laughs> we've got, we've got Christmas, you know, that, you know, Jesus being born with the rebirth of the sun on December 25th, you're right after the solstice. I mean, all these th stuff that, that come from, you know, astrological stuff. Um, and, and you can find these things in, in, in the Old Testament if you look, if, if you know what you're looking for. So what I'm saying is, is drawing this together, we've got the seer stone thing. Well, that was acceptable. That was acceptable. And if you look, religion, Freemasonry, you know, the occult things, magic, alchemy, science, these were all, you know, together as one centuries ago. And then we started seeing that they filtered things out. They, they, you know, these guys that were uh, scientists were you know, alchemists and sorcerers and things like that, like Isaac Newton or, he, you know, Leonardo da Vinci. You look at all these guys and they're involved with Freemasonry or other secretive or secret societies. They're, you know, in the Rosicrucianism or whatever it is, you know. And they filter that stuff out. They're spiritualists. Um, they're, you know, they're, they're having seances to get some of this information. We filter out all that other stuff and separate stuff and say, okay, this is science. And we don't look at, you know, Newton wrote so much on theology and, and uh, alchemy, but you don't see that in your history books. You know, he's just a scientist, you know, right? Um, and we see that with, with, with all of these guys. And, and what we have had changed now is really, if you take a look at, at how, when, when, when we've got the stuff that, that Darwin's got in here with the theory of evolution, all these things, this, this scientific aspect has gotten separated from spiritual or magic aspects. And, and you know, they make Darwin out to be some horrible guy, but he was a religious man um, who basically disproved his unreligious beliefs. And that's not what they'll tell you, but if you look deep enough, you'll, you'll see these things to be the case. And you'll find that some of these things that we got may have come from, you know, spiritual um, sources. So what we have now is this separation that's promoted to say, oh, this is our real world, and that stuff's a bunch of baloney. And we create this separation of science and religion. We create this separation of church and state, or the illusion of it, when really our social structure is still managed by people that are interconnected within religion and other influential organizations, the media, government, banking, that sort of a thing, through the occult. And so you've got the Disney Corporation, which has had an enormous effect on the way people see the world. They have separated things and, and taken things which used to be considered um, more credible in the magic world, the unseen world, the supernatural, and turned it into, it's this, ma this make-believe thing. Okay, and separated it. And what that does, whether, you know, depending on how you see that, if most Mormons, for instance, now think they never had, that have left the church, think they never had a real spiritual experience. It was just emotional or psychological. There are others who have had experiences that can't be explained by those things. Especially when physical things, physical objects, all, you know, or multiple people are involved in something and it's not emotionally based or not psychologically based. There are things in the physical world that are manipulated in such a way that the, people have to say, whoa, you know, this is from something that doesn't happen from our five senses, from some other, some other intelligent force. And those people tend to stay in the church because they have this testimony that, say, overrides all sorts of evidence that they otherwise just throw on their shelf, like Dieter's instructing us to do here, saying, even though it makes sense, no, you know, it doesn't make sense, it doesn't go along with our belief system, put it on the shelf, you'll learn it in the next life. That's essentially what he's saying here. He's saying things that appear to be credible, they can look like they make sense, but, you know, Satan is behind it. He's very smart. Just trust us, and you'll find out the mystery of this in the next life. Um, these other sources aren't truthful, dependable. Um, you know, that sort of a thing. The kind of thing they say in LDS.org, you know, in the Gospel Topics essays, preface to say that all these other sources on the Internet are unreliable. They're inaccurate. They don't like that. They're, they're trying to, they're, they're, they're tempering the language so it doesn't sound so vitriolic. You know, they're calling us critics. Critics, not, not so much anti-Mormon apostates or whatever. But then he, they do bring in, but it is from Satan, you know. So <laughs> kind of like gently putting it in there. Kind of like Gordon B. Hinckley saying, we shouldn't hate our Muslim brothers and we have nothing against them. We don't want anybody to feel bad about these people. But Jesus wants us to bomb them. Jesus wants this invasion to happen. And God will not hold those in uniform 
accountable for their deeds. They, we believe in following the law of the land. Our leaders know things we don't know. And just, you know, let's just pray that everything turns out all right and that the war ends quickly. That was 17 years ago. And, uh, you know, it'll all be better because, you know, Jesus will be in these countries, right? We'll be good to share the gospel. Time to pause it. So I had a interruption there, and hopefully I can get right back on track here, because I haven't re-listened. And what I was saying is that the belief system was acceptable at the time that Joseph Smith came out with the Book of Mormon of pawning this off on people as uh, a revelation received through, very, through a more magical or occult uh, means. And in other words, using the um, the, the, the Christian dogma that, you know, the wise things of the world or, you know, God works not through the wise men of the world or something through some, some scribe, Pharisee, scholar, whatever, uh, to bring us, you know, uh, this book from uh, an ancient language. But no, he uses through the gift and power of God. And so these people were acclimated in the gifts and power that they ascribe to the God of Israel, whatever, you know, so, so there you have it, dancing in trances and doing, you know, gift of tongues. And if you look, Joseph Smith was, um, jo Joseph Smith was uh, using this when he, you know, once we get into him forming the church, uh, he, he was using the, um, the Christian gifts of the spirit stuff to promote the church. Like, like we speak in tongues, we have, you know, interpretation of tongues, which we don't have in the church now. They've, 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 they've turned that down to, well, you know, God just helps us learn a foreign language more quickly because we're a missionary. But if you actually look at the, that in context, what you'll find is that people are basically functioning as mediums for some spiritual intelligence, some being that may not any longer fit into some people's belief system because a lot of, like I said, a lot of people have just dropped the belief of an, an, an unseen world that haven't had such experiences. And this was being promoted. And so the whole magic stone thing, whether it's magic glasses or, or a magic rock, that was okay then. But then it started to become not okay. All right. So we just had, to, he, he had to keep it pretty vague. And he didn't want, you know, some of these Christian people, you know, have this differentiating that the Christians do between the occult and Christianity. We've got, you know, things in the Bible that says, thou shalt let, you know, thou shalt not suffer a witch to live in, was it Exodus 20 or something? It's in there. Um, you know, and things in Deuteronomy uh, that the Christians quote. So some of these people are into this, but some people that Joseph Smith, you know, was hanging out with were okay with things from the magic world. We've got the stuff from Isaiah saying, you know, don't suffer, you know, the, the, get away from wizards that are peeping and muttering. And, and that's just like, you know, Peep stone in a hat, and he's muttering because his face is in a hat. I mean, that almost describes the translation method that's being um, promoted at that time. Translation method. I mean, and, and when you think about, it, so now you got guys like Stephen Smoot just trying to actually make that real and saying translation tools or implements. Joseph Smith was using these instruments. So oh, he likes to use that word. He looks like such, such the freaking nerd scientist. There, it's a scientific now. We Joseph Smith was scientifically using a seer stone. We don't know exactly how God makes these things work. So Christians are all about, hey, that's a cult. That's not cool. But since we've got this whole Disney programming saying, oh, the magic is all freaking make-believe and there's nothing supernatural going on, um, that whole magic stone thing it just doesn't look so good to many of the people. The LDS people tend to be, um, at least in the United States, some of the you know better educated people and so they're more likely to look at a something that, that it seems you know plausible in the physical world through scientific means and, and through the belief system that they've got there rather than the people who are at the top of all these religions who are actually into the occult and they may be magicians and they may practice all kinds of you know things astral projection and sex rituals and all sorts of stuff that people think just isn't even real anymore thanks to what the Disney you know channel channel company has done to create this separation between, uh, you know, the invisible world, the spiritual world, the, the magic world, and science. And so Mormons are in this position that's kind of weird, and, and, it's, and it's like this whole deal is being manipulated in such a way that it, they're trying to make it, they're trying to create a situation where they can merge people from one belief system to another by, by gradually introducing different types of ideas so we went from a from everybody being into like the gifts of the spirit um healings speaking in tongues interpreting of tongues using magic stones for revelations 
you know, which is the same kind of a thing as a crystal ball or, or a dark mirror or as a Ouija board. But we think of it as, you know, if, they, if, we, if we heard, oh, Joseph Smith used a Ouija board to do the Book of Mormon, people would go, oh, what the heck? But somehow they could swallow the magic glasses, even though what we hear over and over is the gift and power of God. Well, if we read, you know, chapter three, uh, either it's, you know, he's got magic glasses. But at least he's looking at the Book of Mormon in the pictures we get from the artist depictions, which is never mentioned in any of it. But we get these messages sent to our subconscious in the end sign of Joseph Smith. He's looking at the plates, you know, through these clear stones. And we already have some legitimacy, legitimacy to clear stones because they're used also to light the barges of the Jaredites. Same chapter, too. So we've had to move things. So they hide. So, so they started hiding the whole seer stone thing in the hat because that just, that was a little bit too, you know, too far into the magic world uh, for the uh, culture that was emerging. So they hid that and said, nah, that's bullshit. It doesn't, sorry, that doesn't exist. Um, you know, that, that isn't real. It's the gift and power of God. And we don't know what it was. It's just too mysterious, you know, yeah. right? And then there's the pressure from people like maybe Michael Quinn or somebody, you know, various people that started putting this stuff out there like magic, you know, uh, you know, whatever it is, uh, early Mormonism in the magic worldview, and some more of these older uh, records are coming out, and we're seeing here, Emma said he was using a stone, David Whitmer said he was using a stone, even read the Revelations, he's like getting down on Hiram Page for using a stone to get Revelations, not because it's a stone, but because Hiram isn't the oracle of God, a seer. Odd thing is, a seer in those days was, you know, someone practicing the occult, practicing magic. But Joseph Smith writes a seer in to Moses chapter 7. You know, Enoch is a seer. His eyes were anointed and he could see those things in the spiritual world, which is what it, Joseph's reputation was. That's why he was hired by Josiah Stoll, because he could see things in the invisible world. You know, he had a gift. He, and they don't tell you this stuff in gospel doctrine generally, right? So now they have to inoculate everybody against this stuff. They've got, to set to, they've got to normalize the seer stone, which is what you know Stephen Smoot is doing with the Book of Mormon Central. They're normalizing this stuff because it had it got exposed, and so now they got the seer stone on LDS.org, and somehow we've got to we got to normalize it for some people. They're going to lose people. They know that they're going to lose people. They don't put it on the front page and say, "Come check out the Gospel Topics essays." But I think they are now exposing people to them in some degree. They're beginning to with the young people. They're using stuff from some of them. They're like. Telling the seminary teacher, you know, you, you, you see in the seminary, seminary teacher's manual, you got, you got these leaders telling the seminary teachers, and, 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 and notice how they say it. They say, you might want to, a use suggestion, you might want to inform the students that Joseph Smith had multiple versions of the first vision, but it's just because he was, you know, sharing it with different audiences. It's perfectly explainable, unless you really look at them carefully and you notice, no, they're not just different. They're, they're, they're contradictory. They're not just a different audience. You know, and then they try to make, like, they use these ridiculous stories, like, see, Paul, Paul did this with his story. He, he emphasized different things. Yeah, really? That was supposed to be a contradiction. And that was a missionary pal. I said, look how Paul's contradicting himself. He said, I saw Jesus. I saw a light, but I didn't hear anything. And the other one, he says, I heard something, but I didn't see anything. And they're saying, he's just giving a little different emphasis. No, he's contradicting himself. And we were told to, you know, basically teach that the, God, that the, that the Bible was not dependable, you know, and here's proof of it. This is, you know, proof of translation error. So we need Joseph Smith to restore the, you know, the truths and that the Catholic Church screwed up, right? So we've got a constant adjustment going on to make things okay in our minds. And these guys are using neurolinguistic programming and hyp hypnotic suggestion, all sorts of techniques. And Jonathan Streeter was pointing out some of these, like in the Jeffrey Holland one here, you know, we got Dieter up here. Dieter is using techniques. These guys are masters at this. And that's a big jump for people to realize that, no, this guy that they thought was this divinely inspired person, he's just persuasive because the Spirit of God is with him. They don't understand the techniques that these people are using that they're actually trained in. They have to be trained in these things. They know what they're doing and they do things that are deliberately deceitful. They say things that are not true. They fake emotions to appear spiritually moved and sincere. And they're so good at it that they're convincing. When people start to do these things, if they, if they blow it, you're like, that's so fake. You know, if you look at a televangelist sometimes and you're watching like whatever Jim Baker start crying how he's repented from getting caught, you know, with a girl or with some other dude in the shower or some BS like that when all these televangelists were getting busted for their corrupt, you know, their, their lascivious activities while they're pretending that they're all, you know, 
pious and sanctified and holy and stuff. And meanwhile, he's like screwing Jessica Hahn and paying her off or got some his boyfriend in the shower or some bullcrap, you know. But they're supposed to look sincere. These guys are masters at their trade. And we look, and, and what Dieter says in this video, he says, you know, all these other people, they look believable, but really they're not. Well, he does too. But I used to say, I used to look at these guys, like I'd, I'd look at Gordon B. Hinckley and I'd go, he's not like Morris Sorello or Benny Hinn or, uh, you know, these, these guys that are man clearly manipulating these people and using fake healings and hitting them in the forehead and, and say, you know, Jesus told you to, you know, all, all this kind of stuff that they use stuff that works on their constituents, their, their parishioners, their victims in their flock. But these guys, I looked and I said, no, our prophet is so dignified in the way he speaks the word of the Lord, you know, because they use a different technique with us. They look so dignified, so scientific, so legit, you know, then sometimes you ask yourself, if God's supposed to like work through the humble, how come like no shoe repair dudes are ever in the quorum of the 12? How come they're all like lawyers, doctors, and business executives of huge corporations and stuff? Oh, because the Lord has helped them to be successful in life because they kept the commandments and whoever keeps the commandments, you know, supposedly will prosper in the land. And he was preparing them for their ministry in the kingdom by giving them experience in the world. And isn't that logical? Yeah, you know, sure, that's logical, sort of. Until you catch these guys lying, or you see the corrupt things that they've done, like, you know, what's his name? The, uh, whatever, the guy was like from San Francisco, ripping off the hospitals and stuff, whatever. I mean, um, the apostle, <laughs> uh, I know their names, but anyway. When we see, it's when we see something that doesn't look right. It's when we see something when we say, wait a minute, isn't that what the, we don't watch JW general conferences or district conferences, so we don't notice them. But when we, if we do and we go, Whoa, they're talking just like our people, but a little more culty, going, Satan wants you to look on the internet to deceive you. Apostates are mentally diseased. They seek to drag you down and separate you from Jehovah God. And you go, gee, those guys sound kind of culty, but our guys say things kind of like that, but they just sound not so culty, you know? Because we're the true church and they're not. But if you start noticing enough of this stuff, you just go, wait a minute. Or if you learn mind control techniques and you go, why, are, why is Dieter using mind control stuff on us? Why is he making, why did he say something that, wait a minute, that's false and he knows it's false. So if you catch him saying something that you know is false, or you can't, like, like, well, like with Holland, when he's going, Joseph and Hiram died because they wouldn't deny the Book of Mormon. Let me cry about it. This very page, corner of page, was turned down as Hiram spoke to Joseph as they journeyed to Carthage. And you're like, wait a minute, this had nothing to do with the Book of Mormon. The whole thing was over Joseph Smith getting, you know. You no, know, it was really about Joseph Smith getting the, you know, destroying the, the, the newspaper press, the expositor that belonged to William Law, because William Law printed what Joseph was doing with all those women in Nauvoo and the spiritual wife system, and also that he had shown him and his wife, uh, or Hiram had, section 132, which Joseph said didn't exist, because he said he was just a one-woman man, but he lied till the day he died. Reference as Joseph Smith, uh, you know, in Nauvoo. Here, here they are. Um, you know, they're about. <clears throat> I don't know. I don't know where they are. Video 100-ish or something. So there's a set of ten of them. Joseph Smith, secret combinations of polyandry and Masonic Danite blood oath, whatever. Um, don't even see the whole title, but that's you know that's that's the that that's the spiritual wife system stuff. Um, the concubinage, the horrendous criminal uh, enterprise that they were running in Nauvoo. So um, it's mostly me reading Joseph Jackson's uh, uh, sworn testimony and some commentary as well, you know. So it's me reading, okay? Mostly. It's not perfect, uh, but uh, it, you know, you can do the dishes. <laughs> you, you, can, you can double task if you want to, multitask and uh, hear this and get some commentary too. It's so much worse than what you might have thought polygamy was. I'll pop this one in for a little extra credit uh, on, 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 for some of you people. You know, so many people look at Mormonism and they go, how can you people believe this crap? I mean, it's so freaking obvious, right? You look at this thing about, about Dieter Uchtdorf, and I'll just throw a challenge out there with, not just not say I believe in anything, you know, with what he's got to say, but 
Dieter and people in the news and people in commercials, and they all state certain things as, as fact, which we've been taught since we were children, okay? So I'm not going to say, hey, I'm a flat earther or anything, because I really haven't studied all their stuff and have no idea what all these people do to make things work for them, just like, but, but like, I don't have to, with the Joseph Smiths, you know, I don't have to figure out how he made the Book of Mormon whether he channeled some of it or got, you know, 15, 20 different books that, that were involved or other people. I don't have to know to know that it's full of shit, okay? I know that God lies in it, and there's all kinds of false information in it, all kinds of screwed up facts, and they don't... By the rules that they create, they blow their own cover. And I do know that, you know... I, I, I do know what curvature is with a circle. And if you walk 157 feet, you're going to go down towards the center if you were on the top of any sphere, 100 feet. The ratio is like 0.63 to 1. And it doesn't change if it's a golf ball size or 100 miles or 1,000 miles or a million miles big. The ratio is the same. It's like percentage. You know, if you give tithe, then you give 10% of whatever it is. You don't give $10. It's not a flat, <laughs> it's not a flat fee. It's 10 for every 100. And so for every... Every 10 steps you walk, you've gone down, if you're on the top of a ball, 6.3 steps. It's, it's, you know, it's like if you walk a kilometer, you know, if you drew a horizontal line from where you are, if you were on a ball, you'd be, if, if you walked a mile, you'd be a kilometer below where you started. That's exactly what curvature is. That's almost exactly, that's 0.62 something. Simple math, but... We've been taught it's not that way, so we just have, we have to believe that you know we use curved pipes and curved chairs and and, and we look down on the floor and use a level and it doesn't detect anything. And you put something round next to something straight and you're like, duh, you know, you walk around a reser a reservoir, you know, and yeah, you disappear, you know, as soon as your height's absorbed by one and a half times the distance, or you know, <laughs> you've gone. You walk 10 feet, you've gone down 6.3. That's all there is to it. It doesn't change, people. But you're freaking nuts if you think that these people are not nuts. That Because we've been told that. Just like the pig face people. But with all these bizarre calculations and bullshit they give you, does anyone know what a damn circle is? Does anybody know the diameter? times pi is the circumference, so half of that is, you know, from the top to the bottom. Distance of a straight line, you know, times 1.57 is the curvature. It's not rocket science. It's, you know, it's really simple math. Anyway, I didn't say any of that. <coughs> I'll still, I'll, I'll believe the Earth is round just because the math doesn't work. Just because I know what a circle is, I'll ignore it. And Dieter throws it out there, like and laughs at it, and all the people laugh. And he's laughing inside because Dieter knows. Dieter knows everything that he says is a lie. Or I mean, he, he could say something that's true, but... He's a manipulator. And you think he's from some wonderful God. That God's a liar. And he's not kind and loving. He's not any of the good things that they say. He isn't. It's right there in the Bible, and yet somehow we ignore it. Auf Wiedersehen. Well, how's that? Have a great day. Like, subscribe, share.